I was for sure the script was going to flip a little bit in 2013 and the Bengals were going to do something more. And I guess to be fair, they did. They won the AFC North in 2013, so the first divisional title in a few years. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was more of the same old, same old. It was deja vu all over again. The third straight year of making the playoffs and the third straight year with an opening round playoff loss, and this time at home to the San Diego Chargers. You know, you look at the Cincinnati Bengals team and you see a talented team on both sides of the ball, a team that maybe, frankly, should be better than what it has shown the past few years. But you start to really wonder, based off of the way this team is constructed and the way this team ultimately has produced over the past few seasons, are they going to continue to just be the bridesmaids? Or at some point in time, are they going to take that next step and become the bride? And you've got a lot of attention in this offseason and a lot of pressure and a lot of heat being put squarely on the shoulders of quarterback Andy Dalton, the Bengals' second-round pick out of TCU in 2011. Now, to be fair, you know, there's reasons to knock Andy Dalton. It seems like he has those games where he's spectacular, and then he has those games where he's very average, mediocre, or bad. And those mediocre or bad performances seem in particular to come in the big games in the playoffs. He just hasn't produced, and he hasn't performed very well. But if you were going to squarely and solely only place the blame on Andy Dalton at this point in time, you were a little bit misguided and you were missing the point. You know, this is a team, you look at their playoff loss to San Diego, their defense to me just flat out didn't show up. You had that Giovanni Bernard fumble in the second quarter. That was a momentum changer. There's always more than one player or more than one play that leads to a loss or a win. Now, sometimes to me, it seems like, especially with certain quarterbacks, they get far too much of the credit when their team wins and far too little of the blame when their team loses. And the bottom line is, is Andy Dalton needs to be a better leader and flat out play better when the chips are on the line. But his team needs to help him out a little bit, too. And now with the Bengals, they lost guys like Anthony Collins and Michael Johnson to free agency. So this is a Bengals team that over the past few years has drafted relatively well. So they've had some depth, but they do have some holes in some key places that they needed to address here in the 2014 NFL Draft. And you look at the results down in the description box, and some people might sit there and say, eh, outside of the first round, did the Bengals really address many of their needs? I think they did. I think there were certain needs that people didn't envision being as much of needs as they actually were. In terms of the best pick that they had, I'll go right there to Jeremy Hill, their second-round pick, the running back out of LSU. A lot of people were confused. They sat there and said, well, wait a second. You just spent a second-round pick on Gio Bernard last year. You have been Jarvis Green Ellis already in the fold. Why would you waste a second-round pick on Jeremy Hill? And to me, the answer is very simple. Gio Bernard is probably not somebody that the Bengals want to rely upon as an every down back. Furthermore, Ben Jarvis Green Ellis does a lot of things that Jeremy Hill does, but Jeremy Hill does them at a younger age and at a much cheaper price tag. And a guy like a Ben Jarvis Green Ellis could end up being cut either before the season starts or maybe after the season. So again, here you're looking at a guy I was one of the best players available at this point in time. Now, maybe would I have taken Carlos Hyde from Ohio State instead of a Jeremy Hill? Perhaps. But I still had Jeremy Hill graded about here, maybe actually a little bit higher. So I thought he was a really good pick for the Cincinnati Bengals at this point in time. And I do feel that he fit a bigger need or filled a bigger need, excuse me, than a lot of people were giving the Bengals organization credit for. In terms of the best value in this draft for the Cincinnati Bengals, I do think it was A.J. McCarron, the quarterback from Alabama, who they got in round number five. Now, to me, I looked at a guy and I thought, you know, he was going to get that system quarterback label. He was going to get that label of, oh, he had an offensive line that gave him all types of time. He had talent around him all over the place. And some of that is true, but at the same point in time, McCarron was a guy that made some big-time throws and some big-time plays. I look at the Texas a and game, for example, and I say this was a guy that demonstrated some of the traits and characteristics and intangibles and leadership and toughness that you wanted out of a starting franchise NFL quarterback. But apparently during the draft process, he didn't interview particularly well. I started to get a little concerned, even though I had a very high grade on him. When I started hearing him talk about it, he thought he was going somewhere between 16 and 35. I'm like, what the hell are you paying attention to? It makes me start to wonder if he's living in a land not based on reality. And maybe there are some issues there in terms of maturity and leadership. And those are not good traits to have when you're trying to become a starting quarterback at the NFL level. But I think the talent is much better on A.J. McCarron than a fifth-round pick, and I think the Bengals ended up getting a real steal. Now, is he a guy that unseats Andy Dalton anytime soon? Maybe. More likely than not, he won't. 
because you're talking about a guy in Andy Dalton who lacks special arm talent, so they drafted another guy in McCarron who, frankly, lacks special arm talent. They're very similar prospects, very similar players in a lot of ways. I think a guy that could surprise for the Cincinnati Bengals is Will Clark, the defensive end from West Virginia. Now, sure, you've got Carlos Dunlap there, and you've got second-round pick from last year, Marcus Hunt. You assume they'll get a lot of the playing time, but a guy like Will Clark, a guy with length who has some quick twitch quickness and speed ability, I think he's a guy with Michael Johnson departing in free agency going to the Buccaneers that's going to get some playing time and could be a nice role player for these guys, a situational pass rusher at the beginning. In terms of some of my second guessing at the Cincinnati Bengals draft, you know, this was a draft to me where this team near, really needed to go and put themselves over the hump and get themselves to the next level, and I'm not really sure that they did that because Darkeese Dennard, their first-round pick, the corner out of Michigan State, you know, a lot of people were in love with this pick. I really wasn't. Part of the reason I wasn't is because in no way, shape, or form was Denner my best corner on the board at this point in time. I had both Jason Verrett and Bradley Roby rated higher. And I thought maybe that Jason Verrett actually fit Cincinnati's defense better than a, a dark East Denner did. Now, a lot of people are looking at Denner as good value at pick number 24, and he doesn't bring a physicality to that Bengal secondary that's sorely been lacking over the past few years, and in particular, some young depth. And hopefully, for the Bengal standpoint, they get a Dennard and they get a Drake Kirkpatrick to stay healthy and contribute, and they have a nice young tandem of corners in their secondary. But again, I'm just not sure that Dennard was the best corner on the board at that point in time. And with an organization that has played bridesmaid the past few years and doesn't really seem they're in the position yet to be the bride, and in part that reason is because of their starting quarterback, Andy Dalton, who's entering a contract year, the Bengals were perfectly positioned there at pick number 24 to roll the dice and take Teddy Bridgewater. And I wonder long term if we look back on this draft three, four, five years from now, when we look back on the Cincinnati Bengals, are they going to regret that? And what I mean is, is if Andy Dalton has a better season and they get to like the AFC Championship game or maybe get to the Super Bowl and lose, are, is Andy Dalton going to get this huge monster contract that's going to saddle this franchise with him for the next few years? Um, you know, these are things to think about. It could have some negative long-term consequences for the organization where they pay this guy out a lot of money who finally played more consistently in bigger and big games in a contract year where they could have had a guy like Bridgewater who steps in and isn't that far below Andy Dalton and has so much more upside and growth and room for potential growth in his career and he comes at a much cheaper price tag over the next four to five seasons. Overall, I gave the Cincinnati Bengals a grade of a C plus. Like I said, you know, Dennard fills a need and maybe for some organizations, they felt he was the best corner on the board. And I get it, and I see it, why it would be for them. I just happen to think that guys like Ferret and Roby were better corners on the board at that point in time. Are they going to regret passing up on a guy like a Teddy Bridgewater? I think potentially they could. This could be one of those things where they're going to wish maybe three or four years down the road they would have taken him instead of sitting there and sticking with Andy Dalton and not really giving him any major competition other than taking A.J. McCarron in round number five. I do like the picks of guys like Jeremy Hill and Will Clark. I think these are guys that will come in and contribute right away in roles that could potentially be starters down the road. But in general, you know, it's just a little bit better than average draft to me for the Cincinnati Bengals, a C-plus draft. And I'm not sure they did enough in this draft to go from being bridesmaids to brides.